questions in chat already. So we can pull up in. Oh, just tell me. Oh, right. It looks more like at home. Mm hmm. It does. It looks more like just like we're at home. Good evening, everybody. I'm Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer at the Franklin Institute Science Museum, your cool astronomer, with the August edition of Night Skies at Home. Night Skies at Home is a program we've been doing since March to provide some additional activities that you can pursue other than watching everything that's available on streaming video and putting together every possible jigsaw puzzle you could find, as many of us are uh, under quarantine these days. So this is a program that provides you with information about the night sky so that you can reconnect to the night sky. You know, everybody has something they like about the evening sky, whether it's looking at stars or if it's looking at the moon, maybe it's even looking for satellites. You know? This is a program that will help to fill in the gaps of the information you already have actually about the night sky in an effort to give you a more complete understanding and then that way, when you go out in the evening to take a look at the sky, you'll feel more comfortable about what you're seeing there. Often people are confused by the giant connect the dots game, if you will, that we call the constellations we see overhead. But it's actually really easy to find your way around the sky. It's not that challenging. And if you add in some other information about how the moon can be seen, how the planets can be seen, then it all becomes much more familiar. Now, the only thing you have to do to add on to this, to make this kind of information uh, melange, if you will, uh, easier to do is all you have to do is look at a star map, map out a constellation first inside, then go outside and find it. And if you repeat that process, oh, every couple of nights, well, in about 14 days time of maybe 10 minutes an evening, 15 minutes an evening, you'll have the whole sky down and you'll know what's what when you're out there seeing it. The other, part, the other part about it is that over that time, you'll also get to know and understand some of the process of how the sky moves, how things work in the sky seasonally. And then that way, you'll be able to keep track of your favorite constellations, your favorite planets and their positions, and you'll be able to figure out what's coming up next. And then we go out to look at the evening sky it's just a glance up to catch the familiar constellations that you've learned and then move on to see other objects in the evening sky. Summer's a great time to do this too. The temperatures are good and that means we can spend more time outside under the evening sky, enjoying the evening. And you know, it's also a great activity to do with your family because you can do it from wherever you are. You can do it right at home in your own backyard or even out on your front steps. This is not something that requires that you go out into the deep countryside. You can actually do it from a center city, from an urban environment. So no matter where you are across the country, even if you're in a city, these instructions, this information will be good for you to use. If you happen to be in a dark sky location, gee, that's great. You'll have lots more stars to see, but that also adds to the complexity of the sky. Working in an urban environment, we have the reverse of that. It's actually a slight improvement because what's available to us urban observers, if you will, are just the brightest stars of each constellation. And then that makes it easier to identify that basic star pattern that represents the artwork we see of the constellations. We'll talk a little bit, we'll talk a little bit more about that as the program goes on. Uh, but let's get started with what we're gonna do tonight, okay? Here we are, it's August the 6th. And since it's August the 6th, just before we are um, coming up to uh, the second week of August, this is a perfect opportunity for us to talk about one of those events of astronomy, observational astronomy, that almost everybody can do really easily. It doesn't require any equipment. In fact, most of the observations I talk about don't require telescopes or binoculars, although they can be helpful. And this particular one is the Perseid meteor shower. The Perseid meteor shower one of the two primary meteor showers of the year. This one in August always occurs somewhere between April 11th and April 13th. This year, the peak is on the night of April 11th into the morning of April 12th. So uh, as soon as the sky gets dark on the evening of April 11th, you can go out and start looking for meteors. We'll give some more specifics. In fact, I have a short program I'll show you about that. And we'll get into some details about what they are and where they come from. and what you can expect to see and all that sort of stuff. So we'll get to that. That's one thing. 
Uh, the second thing that we're going to talk about this evening is planets that are available in the sky. We have great planets available, and there's even a very interesting arrangement involving two planets you can see, one planet you can't see, and extraordinary distances in the solar system. It's something that even though you can't see it, you'll be able to use your mind's eye to make it come into focus when you're outside observing under the evening sky. It's also something that you can show to other people as well. So they can enjoy the same kind of idea of uh, distance in the solar system, okay? Uh, let's see, also this evening, we'll talk about uh, the recent SpaceX Demo 2 mission. You'll recall that just last Sunday, two astronauts returned from International Space Station aboard the SpaceX, uh, the SpaceX uh, Crew Dragon capsule. There, I got it out, the Crew Dragon capsule. Uh, this was the, uh, this was the flight that uh, allowed for full-on testing of a spacecraft that will be used now by NASA to carry astronauts up to International Space Station and back. We'll do a little bit about that. And uh, summer constellations. Wow, we can't forget the summer constellations. So many great constellations. We're not going to do them all, but we'll do a number of the major ones so that you'll be set to find your way around the sky without too much difficulty. And of course, your questions. We need your questions. We need your questions. Send us your questions about space exploration, about astronomy, about the evening sky, about telescopes, anything like that. Meteors and meteor showers. Send us your questions. We'll answer your questions right here. Don't think a question is too simple and don't think a question is too complicated. Uh, I'll tell you right now, though, if it's too complicated, well, guess what? Well, I mean, we may have to do it online because we might need a chalkboard and some chalk to do the long equations and things like that. No, I'm just kidding. We won't do that. But if you do have complicated questions, feel free, to throw, feel free to throw them over here. We'll see what we can do with them. But whatever your question is, bring it to us. We'll see what we can do. So the first thing we're going to do here, is we're going to take a couple of questions right now, if we have any, and we'll take a few questions right now. Then we'll talk about what the sky phenomena are right now, sunrise, sunset, moonrise, moonset, those sorts of things. But this time of this year, we'll compare to some other parts of the year, and then we'll go from there on to the other programs. Okay, so let's start with some questions. Let's see what, my, what we can. Uh, my, uh, my absolutely wonderful executive producer here, Linda, my wife Linda, is uh, going to throw some questions. What do we have? We have two. Any thoughts on the cube in front of the sun? Any thoughts on the cube in front of the sun? Ah, that's a really great question because I have no idea what you're talking about. The cube in front of the sun. So I'm gonna assume that what you're talking about is some kind of uh, structure, artificial structure of some time, some time that you've heard about that's in front of the sun. Uh, number one, I'll say, I haven't heard anything about a cube in front of the sun. And number two, I haven't observed anything in front of the sun. Fortunately, I have access, pretty much like you do too, to some pretty sophisticated telescopes that observe the sun on a regular basis. NASA has two really great satellites that provide imagery of the sun 24 seven uh, from space and they do a really fabulous job. And if you go to either one of those websites, if there is indeed a cube in front of the sun, I think you'll be able to find it there uh, for sure. Uh, but outside of the official channels, like outside of NASA, et cetera, et cetera. None of my friends who do regular solar observing have seen anything either. So I'll have to see if I can find out more about that. Okay, great, thanks. What's the next question? Your fan, Sherry, says that she was inspired by your suggestion to drag a 50 plus year old TASCO telescope out of the attic and she was able to see the moon, exclamation, exclamation, wow. exclamation. Wow, Sherry, I understand you pulled a telescope out of the closet and actually got it to work to look at the moon. Congratulations, that's really fabulous. I hope others will take your example and pull their old telescopes out of the closet too because this is a great month to actually be looking at the sky with a telescope you may have. I know that there are plenty of telescopes buried in closets that haven't been used in a while because, oh, well, maybe there's a piece missing, or you forgot how to use it, or it hasn't been aligned in a while, or something like that. Well, you know, you can always reach out to me with an email or something like that and ask me a question about your telescope. If you have something specific about something that needs to be fixed on it, I can help work you through that. But Sherry, I'm really proud of you for doing that. Congratulations. Uh, you get the astronomer the night pin for that. How about that? 
Great job. And don't forget, you can also use that telescope. If you can see the moon clearly, Sherry, guess what? You can also see Jupiter and Saturn. There's the big reward for you, okay? Great job, thanks a lot. What's next? How does the Mars rover send samples back to Earth? Ah, uh -huh. how does the Mars rover send samples back to Earth? So let's back up a moment. Just last week, a rocket was launched uh, on Thursday that's taking the next Mars rover. It's called Perseverance. The mission overall is called Mars 2020. And that rover left last Thursday. It'll arrive at Mars in February of next year. And when it sets down on the surface, part of the work it's going to do is it's going to collect samples of Martian soil and Martian rocks, not very big ones, but samples nonetheless, it's gonna collect those samples so that they will be prepared for a future mission, a future mission that will go to Mars specifically to pick up those samples. So the current mission that's just left, Mars 2020 Perseverance, will not be sending samples back to Earth itself. It doesn't really have the capability for that. And truthfully, we still have to work out the technology for that, exactly how that's gonna work. Uh, but we have every confidence that engineers will be able to figure that out. And that's the reason why Perseverance is going to be pre uh, preparing the samples. So that's not for this mission. That'll be for a subsequent mission due to happen sometime in the not too distant future. Maybe just a couple of years out. We'll see. Uh, but that's how that's going to work. And of course, what will happen is this new device that lands on the surface will uh, probably work with Perseverance to pick up those samples put them into some kind of launch vehicle that will launch off the surface of Mars and head back to Earth. And so that way we'll be able to get those samples. So uh, keep tuned into NASA's Mars 2020 webpage for more information about that. Okay, one more question and we'll go on. Are there constellations that are named by cultures other than Greek and Roman? question is, are there constellations that are named by cultures other than Greek and Roman cultures? You know, as it turns out, we have used the Greek and Roman constellation names for con constellation names uh, as the default, if you will, the convention, as it's more politically pro uh, appropriate to say, by convention. That means a group of people have gotten together and agreed that the shapes that we see in the sky, the classic shapes that we see in the sky, would be identified by classic Greek and Roman names. However, this is the very coolest thing. Every civilization around the world, every culture around the world has developed their own names for the shapes we see in the sky. Now, the shapes we identify under the classic Roman and Greek names, well, that convention also extends to the shape itself. Uh, the figure that we give to the stars. By the way, the figure we give to the stars, there's a word for that. It's called asterism, asterism. Constellation actually refers to an area of the sky within which that asterism is found. Here's the best example. Many people know the Big Dipper, seven bright stars that make up the shape of a pot with a big handle. Three stars in the handle, four stars in the bowl. Well, the Big Dipper is an asterism within the constellation Ursa Major. Ursa Major is an area of the sky within which the Big Dipper is found. The other asterism that goes with Ursa Major refers to the name itself. Ursa Major is Latin for Big Bear. And so the asterism that can also be seen in that area of the sky is that of a big bear. So we have two really in there that can be seen. But if you go to a different culture, guess what? It's not a bear and it's not a big pot. It's a wagon. It's so weird, doesn't really, you know, from different, from culture to culture, it's different. So in the African-American culture, uh, 300 to 400 years ago, that shape that we see in Ursa Major that we think of as either the wagon or the bear or the dipper, was known to enslave African-Americans as the drinking gourd. So just think of it. You take a gourd, you cut it in half, and you sort of hollow it out so that you can make a drinking cup, and then the neck of the gourd becomes the handle. Well, there you go. And as you look around cultures all across the world, you will find that there are different names and different shapes for these stars. So these are just the ones we use by convention. But that was a really great question. Thank you very much. The last thing I'll say about that is, guess what? We can make up whatever shapes we want. We don't have to go by the conventional shapes. You can dream up your own kind of shape 
just playing a connect the dots game will work out just fine for that. You can do it however you like. Just remember, if you want to talk to someone else about shape of the sky, if you agree upon what the name is and you're talking about the same thing, then you're in good shape. And that's why the convention allows us to use the names that we know as the classic Greek and Roman names. All right, great. So uh, let's go on now and talk about sky phenomena. We'll come back for some more questions in just a moment. So let's start right now by just talking about sunrise and sunset. You know, now here we are at August the 6th, Thursday, August the 6th. Sunrise is now at 6.04 a.m. 6.04. Sunrise around the solstice was at 5.35 a.m. So we've lost quite a bit of time on that end of the day. And at the same time, sunset is the same thing. Sunset is now 8.08 .08 p.m. So in just eight minutes, we'll have sunset. And uh, sunset actually was 8.35 p.m. when we were back in the middle of June. So there's been quite a change in time. We've lost 56 minutes of daylight, if you will, altogether uh, since, this, uh, since the summer solstice back on June 21st. This will continue as we make our way towards the end of the year uh, when we have the least number of minutes of daylight of sunlight during the course of the day. So uh, we all know what this cycle is. So uh, enjoy the rest of the summer while you can, take advantage of it. And we're, even though uh, it's still a great time to be out, there's kind of an advantage to this in that we have more time to observe the dark evening sky because sunsets are coming earlier, okay? So that's not so bad. That's kind of a trade-off that, uh, that we live with for this change in seasons. Now, just think about it. If you lived in a different portion of the world, that seasonal time change might be different. So if you live close to the equator, you don't have very much swing in the difference in sunrise and sunset time, not much swing at all. And if you live at the poles, that's where you have the greatest amount of time swing in terms of seasonal sunlight availability. So uh, it's a fun thing to think about. You could probably figure that out on your own as well. Okay, great, so there's that part. Now let's talk about the moon. Last week, the moon was full over the weekend. And so now the moon is at a waning gibbous phase. That means it's gone from being full, shrinking down a little bit. So it's not quite fully full anymore. It's about four days beyond that. It's 18 days old. That means it's 18 days along in its orbital cycle around the earth. That's about 29 and a half days. So it has a little, more, a little while longer to go. But this also reflects when the moon rises and when the moon sets. So moonrise actually happens tonight at 10.08 p.m. Now, the moon rises about 45 minutes later every day. So if it's 10.08 tonight, tomorrow night, it's going to be around 10.48, 10.50, okay? And of course, since it's rising later, it also means it sets later. Moonrise is tomorrow morning at 9.48 a.m., 9.48 a.m. The next full moon doesn't come until next month, August the 2nd. So if you missed it just this past weekend, well, the next one is coming up will be the, uh, the full moon for September. We'll talk a little bit about full moon names also, uh, just because that's kind of fun. Some cultures refer to the full moon of August as the sturgeon moon. Others refer to it as the blackberry moon. And of course, these names are all related pretty much to agriculture in one way or another. And these are names that are created by cultures some from Europe, many from uh, the Americas, in which these moons were connected to the growing seasons. Well, very good reason for that too, uh, mostly because people wanted to be able to identify which is the proper time of the year to plant, which are the proper times of the year to harvest. And if you connect this to a moon, then you have a whole month of time in which you can sort of assess what's happening with your crops. And it gives you an easy to grasp number or framework of time that you can work within. So the month, the month, the time it takes the moon to go around one cycle uh, is a great way for, it was a great way for that to be done. Now we're much more scientific about it, of course. Uh, but in any case, that's what the name of the moon was. Now there are moon names in September also. Uh, the moon name coming up in early September, uh, the one that's closest to the autumnal equinox that one would be the harvest moon. And then there's another one in October. We'll talk about those. Okay, so what's great to see in the evening sky? We have Perseid meteors that are great. I mentioned before, we have bright planets that are great to see. We have wonderful constellations in the evening sky. We've talked a little bit about Sagittarius and Scorpius. 
two constellations that flank the Milky Way as it comes across the sky and settles down in the south. So tonight we're going to add to this the three constellations of the summer triangle overhead. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I may have mentioned those before too, but I only talked about the bright stars. I didn't talk about the constellations themselves. So let's actually look at those constellations tonight and you'll see how they all fit together uh, right there. Uh, so that's all great. So we'll get around to those things. So, uh, and we'll talk about what's coming up next month too. Let's see if we have a couple more questions. We'll do a couple more questions and then we'll run off into the evening sky and take a look at what's there. And then we'll jump off and do the Perseid meteors specifically, okay? All right. Seven-year-old Charlotte would like to know, are constellations made of stars? <laughs> Hi, Charlotte. Seven-year-old Charlotte, thanks for joining us tonight. You'd like to know if constellations are made up of stars. Yes, they are. Now, earlier, Charlotte, you may have heard me mention that the real definition for constellation these days is an area of the sky within which we find the stars of that constellation. Now, one thing we didn't mention, Charlotte, is that not only do we see the very brightest stars of that constellation, you know, the asterism, the shape we give to the stars, that constellation also contains many, many, many more stars. Some we can see and some that are either too dim or too far away for us to see. So yes, constellations are made up of stars. Some bright ones we can see, some others we can't see, Charlotte, but they're all out there and part of the same constellation. What's next? All right, 11-year-old Dean would like to know, what is your favorite constellation and why? Oh, hey, Dean, you're wondering what my favorite constellation is and why is it my favorite constellation? Oh, that's really difficult. That's like saying I have to choose which of my 88 dogs is my favorite dog, right? That's kind of hard to do. But I'll tell you, let me see. One of my favorite constellations. Well, I'd say that one of my favorite constellations is one that we can actually see. Uh, one we can see in the summer sky. I'm going to talk about it tonight. Constellation Cygnus. It's large, it's bright, it's easy to see. It looks like a big cross in the sky, actually. And let's see, uh, what do I like about it? I like that it has a number of different kinds of objects in it. It has some double stars, it has some bright individual stars, and it even has a location where the first black hole ever identified is located. Now, of course, that's very far away from us and we don't have to worry about that. But I like it that the constellation itself represents a flying figure. Cygnus actually represents a gigantic swan flying along the Milky Way. So that's a little bit of the story. My favorite, we'll tell you a little bit more later. Let's do one more question, then we'll jump off into the sky. Did you hear about the meteor that hit in Nigeria, Africa in March? Oh, a meteor came to the ground in Nigeria in March, I'm hearing. I did not hear about that story. If it did in fact reach the ground, we would now call it a meteorite. And maybe there are some uh, meteorite hunters out looking for it. You know, in order for that object to hit the ground, it had to be at least the size of a baseball or a uh, softball. And we'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment. But here's what we're gonna do right now. Thanks for that question. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to it. I'm gonna grab my computer, bring it over here. We're gonna share the screen and we're gonna jump off into the night sky and take a look at some constellations that are available to us right now. You know what? You can actually follow along at home if you like in a couple of different ways. Just give me a moment to get my camera set up here. You can actually follow along in a couple of different ways. You can follow on the screen with me here but the program that I'm going to use is one that I really enjoy using. I'm gonna share my screen here so we can get out to where I really wanna go. And uh, let me see, can I just uh, get the, oh yes, here we are. Okay, I'm gonna minimize myself here. We don't need to see me so much, great. Uh, you can see where we are here with the Zoom. Okay, follow me along. I'm gonna come right down here to this little tab called Stellarium Web Online. I really like Stellarium Web because it's really easy to use. If I just click on the tab, it'll bring me to the screen that you see before us now. Hopefully you can all see this. Over here, you know, are the plugins they want you to buy. So let's let that go away. Here we have the night sky. I like this program. I like it because the stars are nice and big and you can see them really easily. 
And uh, what I'm gonna do is first, I'm gonna point out some things to you so you're familiar with things here. Over here on the right-hand side of the screen is the letter E for the direction east. Come down to the bottom is the letter N for north. Over here to the left is the W for west. And I'm gonna turn us around here. So follow along how I'm gonna turn. I'm gonna turn us around in this direction. What I've done is I'm just grabbing the arrow and pulling it around. And what I wanna do is I wanna set us up so that we're looking into the Southern portion of the sky. So here's South right out here in front of us. There we go, right there. And I have brought us back a bit from the sky so you can see the horizon right out here. And that gives us a very large view of the sky. Not so bad, but fairly large view of the sky. And last, what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna pull us in a little bit like this, just a little bit like that. And I've pulled this in so that we can see the particular constellations that I want you to look for a little bit easier. So um, let's do it this way. In fact, excuse me while I just change it a little bit. I'm gonna back us out a little bit like this. And then I'm gonna bring up the constellation outlines uh, using this tab right at the bottom of the screen that says constellations. And what that's going to do is it's going to give us names and it's going to give us lines between stars, as you can see here right now. Now, I did this just so you can see the constellations, the big major constellations across the sky during the summer. Now, this might look like a mishmash, but there's actually a way for you to organize how this works. And the easiest way to organize how this works, I think, is to follow along down through here where the planets are. So this little line that comes right down here, if I draw my uh, cursor down through here, you're gonna come through a group of constellations that I think many of you are familiar with. I'm gonna start over here in the West. There's Virgo. I think you probably know that name from another astronomy context. Here's Libra right here, one you might know. Scorpius, you've heard me mention that before. Here's Sagittarius right over here. If you haven't heard me mention it, you know the name. Capricornus, and over here is Aquarius, right here on this side. I'm gonna to add to this for you. Maybe I didn't call out a name that you know. I'm gonna start on this side right here. See this guy right here? It's part of a group called Pisces. So there's another clue for you. And the last clue is this one over here. This is the back end of one called Leo, Leo. So I'm sure you recognize these names. They're part of the Zodiac group of constellations, the Zodiac group. The word Zodiac itself means circle of living things. And these constellations that we see here are part of that group of the circle of living things. We know that, the, that there are 12 in the group, classically 12 in the group. And we can see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of those. The other four are around in the sky of the winter. And that's when you'd see them. So these actually give you a pathway through the sky where the sun, moon, and planets travel. So if you look, wow right down there. There's Jupiter right behind Sagittarius, right between Sagittarius and Capricornus. But the other big dot you see here, that's Saturn. So we have Jupiter and Saturn right down here among these constellations of the zodiac group right here. Now, if you wanted to find these in the sky, all you'd have to do is take a look at the star map, recognize what the basic shape looks like. And Scorpius is a very good example because it looks like a big S shape right here. So you'd memorize what that looks like. Then you go outside and you find that in the sky. And once you find that in the sky, that's after the sky gets dark, then you can reward yourself somehow. Chocolate, ice cream, a donut, glass of wine, whatever it is that you use for a reward, that gives you positive reinforcement. And then you're in good shape because now you want to do it again, right? Yeah, you certainly want to do it again. So now when you're going to do it again, the next thing you're going to do the very next night you go out, you're gonna find another constellation adjacent and you're gonna memorize the basic pattern. And then you'll go out and you'll find the two constellations. It's all you have to do. Then you get another reward. This is not something in, when you, in which you spend four hours a night trying to do this. No, 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 no. This is 15 minutes at the most per night. That's it, that's it. No frustration. That's not what we're after here. So if you do this night after clear night when you have 15 minutes after dinner, that way you can learn what's out there pretty quickly. Okay, but of course, you can also use Jupiter and Saturn as guides for where you want to go because Jupiter's so big, you can't miss it. Saturn is smaller, but it still glows with a steady bright light. So that would work out really, really well. Now, let me see. If you had a small telescope, 
these would be two great targets for you to see uh, when you're out observing in the evening sky during the summer right now while the temperature is nice and warm. And they would be a great targets for you to use to sort of get used to using your telescope again and figuring out how to work. Okay, so that takes care of those constellations right across the bottom of the sky, right there in the south. Hopefully, they'll be easy for you to find. Here's a map like this one. This is free. As you can see, the URL here is stellarium-web.org, and you can use it too. It's very easy, works out really well. All right, let's come up from the bottom portion of the sky and work our way up toward the top. And the reason why I'm sort of skipping some of these other constellations in here is because their stars aren't very bright. Ophiuchus, for example. Ophiuchus is a nice constellation that fits in here between Scorpius and Hercules up at the top of the sky, but not so easy to see. Same is true for Serpens over here. And if we go way over here to Arcturus in Buotes, Buotes might be a challenge, but the bright red star Arcturus is relatively easy to see, so you can give that a shot. But now we come into a group of constellations in the summer right overhead that are really excellent constellations for observing the sky, the top of the sky and the sun. It's this one right here called Aquila the Eagle, Aquila the Eagle. There's Cygnus right up here. Daniel, I think it was, was asking about my favorite constellation. There's Cygnus the Swan right up there at the top of the sky. And then right next to it, this little guy right here called Lyra, Lyra. Now you might've thought I was gonna go to Hercules, Sort of gives you the idea, big constellations, something worth seeing. And yeah, the shape is pretty cool, but it doesn't have bright stars like these other three do. Now, the three main stars of those constellations make up what I've been referring to as the summer triangle. The summer triangle, very easy to see in the sky. And all it requires is that you identify this bright star right here. I'll give you the name. It's called Deneb, D-E-N-E-B. Here's another cool thing about this particular program. If you put your cursor on a star and click it, you'll get not just the name, but you'll get all this other cool information over here about Cygnus as well. You'll see what it says right out here along the side. It gives all this cool information. And it shows that Deneb out here is about 1,500 light years away. 1,400 light years away. 1,411.95 light years. That's a pretty accurate definition for distance. So I'm a little suspect about that because the greater the distance, the more opportunity there is for error in how we measure that distance. So let's just say 1400 light years. There we go, right out there. But look at the information here. So you have that information, that's cool. So there's Deneb right there. You'll need that star for one corner of the triangle, one point in the triangle. Here's the next one we're gonna use right down here. This bright star down here in Aquila the Eagle. This one is called Altair, Altair. And you can see that Altair is just 16 light years away. There's the information that gives you all this kind of stuff here, 16 light years away. And then last but not least is one of my favorite stars in the sky. It's this guy right over here, Vega, Vega. I really like Vega because it's a very bright, sharp looking star. And in a telescope, this is the only star I know of that looks more like a diamond than any other star in the sky. It's really gorgeous to see. And Vegas, not very far away from us either. It's only 25 light years away. So it's relatively close, somewhat like Aquila the Eagle. Uh, I'm sorry, somewhat like Altair in the constellation Aquila the Eagle. So what do we have here for constellations? Well, we have three interesting things to our birds. And one is a very, very different class of object altogether. You know how you play the game, animal, mineral, vegetable? Well, it's not a vegetable. It's not a mineral. Well, you might think of it as a mineral. And it's not an animal. But let's do it this way. So Cygnus, as I mentioned before, is a swan. It also looks like a big cross. Let me identify the parts that make it look like the cross first. We'll start here at the head of the cross. Come down here to the center. Then down to the bottom is the foot of the cross. And here are the arms of the cross. Here's the crossbar of the cross right here. So you can easily see that gigantic plus sign in the sky, right? Okay, not hard at all. But let's make it into the bird that it actually is. So now this becomes a wing stretched out here on this side and another wing stretched out on this side. Right here, Dena becomes the tail of the bird 
And in fact, the word Deneb itself means tail because one of the stars over in Leo called Denebola is the tail of the lion, Deneb Ola. This is Deneb in Cygnus, the tail of the bird. Right down here though is the bill of the swan right here at a star called Albireo. And that's a really cool star. It's a really cool star, why? Because it's a double. It's a double star. Two stars very close together. And these two stars very close together, guess what? I've just zoomed in here now so that we can get really close to this. And if I can keep it together here, right at Albireo, can we get close enough to split those two stars? Yes, we can. Now, here's the cool thing about this double star here, Albireo, you can see in the center of the screen. One of them is gold and the other one is blue. Oh, a stark blue color and a stark sort of orange color. So you can actually see this in a pair of binoculars or in a small telescope, the colors of these two stars, gold and blue. Now the colors give us different temperatures and I'll let you figure that part out. You can do a little research and digging on your own to figure that part out. But that star right there, that star is the one that looks like it has these two great colors. Now coming back out, of course, I got us a little deorient, disoriented. So I've just brought us back into orientation again. I'll bring us back up so we can see the horizon. We all feel comfortable about where we are. Let's go back, uh, let's go out a little bit more because we do need, uh, we do need Cygnus and Lyra as we continue. Okay, so we'll come out a little bit more, there we are. So now we understand that Cygnus happens to be that swan, that swan in the sky here. And note that the bill in this way is heading down toward the Milky Way. Let's go over here to Lyra. This constellation is something different. It's actually a gigantic, I shouldn't say gigantic. It's actually a small harp, a harp in the sky. Lyra the harp, it's a stringed instrument. And the bright star Vega, as I said, looks like a diamond in the sky. And that's really cool too. Here's another target for you right next to Vega, right here, this little guy right here. That actually happens to be two pair of two stars that are right next to each other in the sky. If you use binoculars, you'll see how this one star separates or splits out into two stars. But you'll need a telescope to separate each of those two into their two stars. But there's a target for you to try for that. So that's kind of cool. That's kind of fun to see in the sky. That's not bad at all. And then last but not least, we're going to come down again. I need to rotate my sky around. I see. Here we go. Just to get things squared away. And then finally, Aquila the eagle right down here. Another bird flying along in the sky. Here's the head of the eagle right here at the star Altair, as we spoke of before. Here's one wing, one wing, tail down here flying in this direction. So these two birds are sort of flying at each other, but fortunately, they'll never crash into each other. But let's see what the artwork looks like for those two stars, uh, those, those three constellations at the top of the sky. Now you'll see all of the artwork for all of the other ones in the sky here too. I'm gonna to back us out just a little bit. And I think I'll take away the constellation names and let's see if we can bring the artwork. Now, here's a little bit of artwork for us. Now let's see. Here's the harp right here. And right in here, we can see Cygnus the swan, tail right here, bill right here. Uh, this constellation, this little tiny one right in the middle, that one is called Volpecula, Volpecula, which means the fox, right? And you can see a little bit of the fox's face here and tail, but that little constellation right there is Volpecula. And then right down here, here is Aquila the Eagle with the bright star Altair. Now, the cool thing about those three stars is about distance. We'll talk a little bit more about this distance later, but let's do this right quick here. And the distance is that these three stars all appear to have the same brightness. They all appear to have brightness pretty close to each other. But here's the interesting thing. This star right here, Aquila, is 16 light years away. Just 16 light years away. This star right here, Vega, is 25 light years away, a little bit farther away. So if they're about the same brightness, doesn't that sort of tell you that either Vega's putting out way more energy to make it appear just as bright as the closer one, or maybe the closer one is a little weaker. Either way, there's a power difference between those two. And then last but not least, this one right up here, Deneb. 
they all appear to be the same brightness. But if you remember, Deneb was 1400 light years away. So that must be a really big and powerful star in order to appear the same brightness as these other two that are so much closer. That's a really cool thing to be able to identify in the sky. Okay, so you can see the artwork for the others and you can play with this in this program on your own to learn what the other artworks look like. So uh, I think now we have this great setup of the sky where we can see these constellations that are part of the zodiac group where the sun, moon and planets travel. And then we spoke of these three constellations that make up the summer triangle, Cygnus the Swan, Lyra the Harp, and Aquila the Eagle right here with their three bright stars. Easy to see. One last thing, let's mention this about these planets down here, because we're gonna zoom in close on these just like this, just so you can see where they are. So you see Sagittarius over here on the right. Here's Jupiter and here's Saturn. Ready for this? Right in the middle, right in here, where you can't see anything, right in there, the planet Pluto is right in that direction. Now, here's the cool thing about it. You're never gonna see Pluto. Why not? It's so small, it's so dim. You'll never be able to pick it up. You'd need a really, really big telescope very far away from city lights in order to be able to see it. And then it would still not look like very much in a telescope. So don't worry about not seeing it in the telescope. But here's the cool thing. Jupiter stands at an average distance from Earth of about 484 million miles. 484 million miles. Saturn is farther away. It's about twice that distance at 886 million miles away. So we have 484 and we have 886, okay? Now, the next two planets in line, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, is about 1 billion miles out. 1 billion. It's not in the field here. The next one, Neptune, is another billion miles out, approximately. So we have 484, 886, Uranus at 1 billion, Neptune at about 2 billion, a little more than 2 billion, and another billion miles out from that is Pluto. So out in this direction, right out in here, at about 3.6 billion miles out from Earth is little tiny Pluto. So when you look at the sky, Here's what you can kind of imagine. Jupiter is the one that's close. Saturn's a little farther away, but in between the two is Pluto and it's way, way, way out. Think about that when you're looking at the sky and hopefully that'll make it pop into three dimensions for you. Okay, so we've had enough time to look around the sky here. Please use this program. It'll really help you with this and that'll be a great way for you to find your way around. Okay, so next what we're gonna do is we have to do the Perseid meteor. So let's get on to that. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to minimize the screen here. And that's gonna allow me to bring this program forward so that we can make, a look, make use of this one. This is a program that I created to help us understand a little bit more about dust from space, asteroids, comets, meteors. Now we're really after the meteors part of this. So let's get rolling right along with this. So space dust, plenty of space dust in our neighborhood. And here we can see the arrangement of planets. And guess what? They're not this close together. It's just been scaled so that we can put them onto one slide really easily. But there's plenty of dust in our solar system and a lot of it is asteroids. Asteroids are a hunk of material left over from the beginning of the solar system that haven't been swept up into planets. And so it's out there orbiting around the sun. And you can see right here in this graphic what that or what, where some of those asteroids are. So there's the main asteroid belt here, and then there are the asteroids that sort of orbit along in the same path as Jupiter. And there are many, many, many more uh, asteroids throughout the solar system. If we wanted to compare asteroids to something else, we might compare them in size to comets. So in this image, this image that's been all put together to show you these different things, all these objects that you see here, the big ones here in the center and then off to the upper on the left side, those are all asteroids. Down here in the lower corner, these are comets. Now, the reason why we mentioned comets is because meteors are the dust and dirt that melt out of the nucleus of comets. So right down here, you're seeing images of the nucleus of various comets, the most famous one being Comet Halley right here. But when we see meteor showers in the sky, we're actually seeing the dust and dirt that melts out of the nucleus of a comet. 
Oh, wait, no, not that kind of comet. That's a comet from 1964, a Mercury car called a comet. Not that one, not that one. But comets like this that you might see in the evening sky. Now, these are from a couple of years ago and were very easily seen. And we had a comet come through our solar system just a couple of weeks ago, Comet Neowise, that some may have seen. Uh, but the skies are really murky here this summer around this region, so that made it difficult. But these are real comets. Comets are objects that move through the solar system at a relatively slow pace. And so it takes several weeks for them to make their orbit around this portion of the solar system and head back out. And as they make their way through, radiation from the sun melts the nucleus and creates sometimes gorgeous tails that can be seen. But it's not just uh, dust that's under the bed uh, for comets as we talk about space dust. Oh, that was just my water jug on the floor there. But when we were looking for the Perseids in particular, this is dust that looks like it's coming from the constellation Perseus. Now this map shows you where you can look in the evening sky next week to see the Perseid meteors. Now the Perseids, as I said, are one of the two main uh, meteor showers of the year. Reason why? The numbers per hour. How many meteors might you see per hour? Well, for the Perseus shower, you might see as many as 70 or 80 per hour under the best sky conditions. You'll see at least 60. But if you look in this direction toward the northeast at 11 p.m., here's the constellation Perseus that lends its name to these meteors. And we'll see them streaking across the sky as if they're coming from this location. So that's why this is called the radiant point, because they seem to come from there. And that's why they're called Perseid, because they seem to be coming out of the constellation Perseus. So you're looking toward the northeast, 11 p.m. And here's my advice for you. As soon as the sky gets dark, start looking for them. Hopefully you'll see them. Now, the meteors themselves come from the comet Swift-Tuttle. The uh, Swift-Tuttle's nucleus has been melting as it goes around the sun. And it was just here in the 1990s, in this portion of the solar system in the 1990s. But it's a fairly long term, so we won't see it again for another little while. But as the dust melts out, Earth passes through that. And here we are, Earth in its orbital path. And here's the orbital path of Comet Swift-Tuttle. And as we pass through around August 13th, we get the stream of meteors we see in the evening sky. And we call it the Perseid meteor shower. So what happens is, we cross the stream. Yeah, that's how it works. We cross the stream. It's like walking across a stream in a forest. You know, you start out on the bank where it's a little muddy, then you get into the little deeper part where your feet get wet. And then the next thing you know, you're out in the middle of the stream, you're up to your knees. Well, for us, that's gonna be next Tuesday evening, August 11th to August 12th, when we'll have the greatest number of meteors per hour will be right in the center of the stream. We'd love to see something that looks like this, a lot of meteors streaking through the sky. But what we really see is something a little more, well, without the northern lights, of course, we might be able to see bright streaks zipping across the sky. Since it's somewhere between 60 and 90 or 60 and 80 per hour, that means we're looking for one approximately every minute or so, every hour, every minute. Now, we'll see more than that because they'll come and go in the numbers and we'll see them all over the sky. But the darker your skies are, the more you'll see. And if you're living in a center city environment, you'll see only the brightest ones, but it's still a fun thing to do and easy to do because you don't need any kind of optical aid at all. This is a time-lapse photograph that shows us a lot of meteors falling on a night like the Perseid night. And hopefully we get to see that. The challenge for us though, is where do we find dark skies? So here we are right in this region right over here and you can see how much night light there is across the entire United States. Uh, there's Philadelphia and New York. Uh, let's see, there's a Washington DC right down here. Here's Philly, here's Washington. Here's Chicago out over here. There's Los Angeles and look where it's nice and dark. But there are pockets of darkness that we can find around here on the East Coast. And if you just get yourselves away from city lights, if you can, that'll help to improve your image. This is a NASA image, by the way, and you can find that online without any difficulty. So if you go out and look up, hopefully you'll be able to catch some of the Perseid meteors as they zip by. Remember, as I said, if they're big enough, they can fall all the way down to the surface of the earth. And then once they strike, we call them meteorites. So here's what you need. Good weather, minimum cloud cover, dark skies away from city lights if you can do it. No moon would be best. Unfortunately, this year, last quarter moon is rising at about six, uh, I'm sorry, about 1245 a.m. on the morning of the 12th. 
So that's gonna hamper our viewing in the early morning hours. And that's why I say, start on the 11th as soon as the sky gets dark, you'll have dark skies. So you need a nice comfortable chair that you can lean back in to look at the sky, some dessert, some music, some uh, socially distanced friends might be fun to have on board and no telescope at all. No telescope at all, really. But if you're lucky and something comes crashing in through the atmosphere, maybe a piece of space dust might be found if only it were this easy. But you know what? It's really, really hard because most of the stuff that falls in is very small. Guess what? Did you know that the meteors we see in the sky as shooting stars, falling stars, really meteors? They're only the size of sand grains. Yeah, they're really tiny, but they travel at enormous speeds, 45,000 miles an hour. So all that velocity cramming into the Earth's atmosphere causes the air around that particle to heat up and glow. And that's what creates the streak we see in the sky. But as it also rams into the atmosphere, that energy that we see from that heat that's generated is also dissipating the energy of the object as it falls in. So it slows down and eventually just drifts to the ground. So that's why something has to be about the size of a baseball or a softball to reach the surface. This, by the way, is not a meteorite. That's not a meteorite, that's just a hunk of coal. So don't think about that. But if something is big enough, it can create something like this, Meteor Crater, Arizona. This is about a mile wide and a quarter of a mile deep near Flagstaff. If you have a chance, go see it, it's really miraculous. We have a piece of that meteor at the Franklin Institute. Last but not least, here are the other showers that we have for the year. And the only other shower that's really worth mentioning is the geminid one down here in December. But we'll get to that in, uh, in, we'll get to that in, January, uh, in uh, December. All right, so that's the story for the Perseids. We'll finish that off, I'm sure, with a few more questions. Uh, that's the end of that. I'll stop the share now. So we have a couple of other things we want to try to get to here during the course of the evening. And so let's just answer a few more of your questions. I don't think I'll need this. So I'm going to move this back just a little bit here. And then we'll just uh, check and see. Now, I understand we have some more questions. So let's get back to your questions because we want to answer those. OK, Linda, what do we have for more questions? Can the Franklin Institute telescope see Pluto? And what is the circular constellation going through the Milky Way? So the question is, can the Franklin Institute telescope see Pluto? Can Franklin Institute telescope see Pluto? Uh, no, <laughs> no, it can't. Franklin Institute telescope is great. I love that telescope and I've used it for a number of years and I'm very happy with it and would be glad to bring it home to my backyard to use. But uh, no, it's not big enough to see Pluto. I've tried and I haven't been able to see it. And also we're in Center City, Philadelphia, the sky's too bright. So we can't really see Pluto, but we can see all the other classic planets really, really well. And the other question is, what's that circular constellation that's found along in the Milky Way? Well, goodness gracious, the one circular constellation I think I can think of off the top of my head without looking at a map is uh, Corona Borealis. Corona Borealis, it sort of looks like a half circle in the sky. And that may be the one you're thinking of, but you know what to do? Take a pair of binoculars out at night and just scan along the Milky Way from overhead all the way down to the south where it comes between Sagittarius and Scorpius. You'll see all manner of really cool things there. It's really worth doing that. What's next? Do you think there's a risk of the Earth shifting off its axis due to tons of material we send into space? Yeah, do I think there's a risk of the Earth shifting off of its axis because of what we send into space? You know, that's a great question because I can tell you're thinking about the forces that are involved. But remember that anything that we as humans do on the planet in terms of forces of moving things is absolutely almost immeasurably minute. So there's nothing we can do on the planet to push it off its course because it takes so much energy to do anything. The mass of the earth is really enormous. I can't even make you understand how enormous it is. It's so enormous, but we can't do anything in that regard. However, I would really be remiss if I didn't at least mention that, yes, we can have an effect on the Earth. We're having an effect on the Earth's atmosphere right now because of the pollution that we create. And that's one way in which we can have a very serious effect on the Earth. And it's incumbent upon each and every one of us humans to do what we can to eliminate that, eliminate that so that we can all live here comfortably. Okay, enough of the political stuff on that. What's next? 
Is it true that the International Space Station will fall out of orbit in 2024? If so, why? Is it true that International Space Station will fall out of orbit in 2024? And if so, why? Well, if it were to fall out of orbit, maybe one of the reasons is because uh, Congress isn't funding it. No, 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 I'm only joking. No, no, no. Space Station won't fall out of the sky in 2024. And the reason why is because uh, it's, it's, well, let me do it this way. If we don't maintain International Space Station and keep boosting it in orbit, it will eventually fall down. Yes, that's correct. No question about that. Will it happen in 2024? Most likely not. And the reason why is because Space Station is so vital. It's so usable. It has been upgraded so that it will last for a very long time. What we're going to do, though, is we're going to shift away from how it's being used now to another way to use International Space Station in which we sort of extend its useful life. And we'll keep doing that. The reason why is because we have invested so much money in International Space Station, and it's still perfectly good and usable, it would not make sense for us to deorbit it anytime soon. It can easily keep going for another 10 years, and we should take advantage of that. So don't think about 2024. Think further out, maybe when we come up with the next level of technology that supersedes Space Station. What's next? 10-year-old Claire would like to know, why are there so many different colors in the sky? Hey, Claire. Thanks for watching tonight. You're wondering why there's so many different colors in the sky? Ah, it's all the light that comes from the sun and how it scatters around the atmosphere, Claire. It has to do with dust particles, water vapor droplets, the angle at which we see the light coming around the sky. All of those things help to create the marvelous color we see, including the basic blue sky that we see in the sky, you know, the regular sky color. That's just gorgeous. But then even that gets altered as sunlight comes streaming through dust particles or water droplets, things like that. I think the best example of that, Claire, is a rainbow. Sunlight coming through little droplets of water in the sky. The droplets of water break open the white light of the sun and show us all the colors that are mixed in. It always looks really cool. Keep watching the sky, Claire. Thanks for that. That's a great question. 10-year-old Noel would like to know, does the sun move? Ah, Noel wants to know if the sun moves. Hi, Noel. Thanks for joining us tonight. Yes, indeed, the sun does move. Yeah, when we sort of see it in the sky, we like to say that the sun is moving across the sky, and it's actually the Earth rotating on its axis. But the sun does move in the sky. The sun is a star in the Milky Way, and the sun has its own motion through our galaxy, the Milky Way. And as the sun moves through the Milky Way, it carries our solar system along with it. So we get to travel with the sun as it orbits around the center of the solar system, just like the Earth orbits around the sun. Well, our star orbits around the center of the, of the, of the Milky Way. And so we get to travel along with it. It's a long, long, long orbit, millions upon millions of years. Uh, so we can see how the position changes if we map the position of stars and we sort of watch them very carefully over long periods of time, we can see how the star positions change as the sun changes its position in the Milky Way too. So yep, it sure does move. Not very quickly, but it does. Yes, what's next? Nine-year-old Jesse wants to know what happens to everything sucked into a black hole and how do you know? <laughs> Hey, Jesse, you want to know what happens to everything that gets sucked into a black hole, and how do we know? Let's go with the how do we know. We'll go with the how do we know this, Jesse, because we can't see black holes. We simply can't see them. Yes, there have been quote unquote pictures of black holes, not exactly photographs directly, so we can't see them. So we have to figure it out right here on Earth how we think a black hole would work. So we describe all the conditions, and then we figure out how those conditions would act on material. And here's what we've learned. Any object that approaches a black hole, if it gets close enough, will be torn apart by the tidal forces of the black hole. And as it tears the object apart, it will break it down into its basic chemical elements, and then into molecules, and then into the atoms. And then that's it. Some of it will get radiated away as it's heated up as radiation, as energy. And some will stay in orbit around the singularity of the black hole forever. We can't think of a black hole as an actual hole in space, like a hole where stuff goes in. We can't think of it that way, because that's not really what happens. Although it's a nice way to sort of imaginary way to think of it. 
because once something approaches a black hole, it never comes out again, or it comes, we never see it again. And that's because the gravitational pull is so strong, nothing can ever escape a black hole. So uh, we don't have to worry. There are no black holes anywhere near us. And so they're always fun to think about because understanding black holes helps us to understand yet another stage in the life of a star. Okay, so let's see, what did we cover this evening? We covered a lot this evening, goodness gracious. We talked about sunrise and sunset this time of year. We talked about moonrise and moonset coming up right around now. We talked about the constellations that we see in the summer sky. We talked about those bright planets. We talked about the, the program that I like to use, stellarium-web.org, that you can use as a star map to find your way around the sky. And we talked about how Pluto is located right between Jupiter and Saturn, billions of miles out, you can imagine that. And uh, we also talked uh, this evening uh, a little bit more about your questions. That was really important for us to do. So I think we've hit everything we wanted to get this evening. And so next month, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about the autumnal equinox coming up in the middle of the month. And we'll talk about the moons, the harvest moon in September, and one other moon that goes with that as a pair that comes up in the next month, but we'll put the two together and talk about those. Now remember, it only takes a few minutes each day to catch up with the sky. You don't really have to spend an hour. You're only gonna spend maybe 15 minutes doing this. And if you do it as I describe it, you'll learn the sky in about two weeks, about two and a half weeks. Take some friends out with you, take some family out with you to enjoy the sky. You know, it's a great way to reconnect with the universe. And you know, nowadays, maybe it's a good idea for us to get outside in the evening and just uh, exhale a little bit. Take a moment to relax. Take a moment to look up at the sky and enjoy the beauty of the evening sky. So as I like to say, you know, it's your universe, you should explore it. So get out and do that. Now remember, before we go, the Franklin Institute is now open. So we want you to come visit us. We've got all these great protocols in place for your safety and you can still have a great time with the exhibitions we have open. Remember right now we have this great traveling exhibit called The Presidents. You should come check that out as well as some of your other favorite exhibits at the Franklin Institute. In fact, I'm there often too. And if you wanna stop by and ask me a question, please feel free to. I'll be happy to meet you and help you with a little bit of astronomy stuff. Okay, great stuff to be seen in the sky. We've had a good time tonight. We looked at a lot. I hope it was very helpful. Don't forget, Perseid meteors next week, August 11th into the 12th, as soon as the sky gets dark, you go out and look and enjoy observing the evening sky. Thanks for all the great questions. Thanks for being with us. And we'll see you next month because we're gonna do this again on the first Thursday night of the month of September. So we'll be looking for you then. Come back and join us. If you sent us a question, we didn't get to answer it here. Don't worry, we'll jump online and answer your question later. Again, thanks for joining us. Marvelous to have you with us. I'm Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer at the Franklin Institute, your cool astronomer. You can also reach out to me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is, of course, at cool astronomer. What else would it be? That's me. Okay, thanks for joining us. You folks have a great evening. Enjoy the rest of the month, and we'll see you in September. Take care. Lots of great questions this evening. Oh, indeed. Yeah. So to get to, really enjoyable. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. great getting those questions like that. Well, yeah, sure. We can make sure we answer them in line. And I love to see how people are thinking about how the sky works and trying to figure things out. It's all stuff we sort of know. We just need a context to put it in that makes more sense for us. Yes, and all the young astronomers that are out there listening too. That's great.